When I was thinking about talking today, I I thought I would talk through what usually comes across my desk, but lately that's getting rather depressing. So I thought, um, as much for myself as for all of you, I would think through some of the little lessons that I've learned in the last 20 years after having the great privilege of being paid to work in the human rights space on behalf of many people, um, in the hope that that would provide you some succor and thoughts for how we might deal with what comes ahead. So my journey started 21 years ago when Pauline Hanson was elected to the Senate. Outraged by her brand of of racism dressed up as honesty, together with some other friends from high school, we decided to march the streets, go on strike as it were, against racism and her presence in our parliament. So off we went in our school uniforms with nearly thousands of others across the country, sure that our actions would definitely contribute to ending Pauline Hanson's career. Which brings me to lesson number one that I remember, given that Senator Hanson is still there, which is never give up. (laughs) And be prepared to continue fighting for years on end. But the second lesson, actually, is that determination only gets you so far. Because my second lesson came around six years ago, which was after slamming my head and many others against the wall of offshore detention. It was about a lesson about when you get to a roadblock, try another route. And six years ago, I had my second child. And I was sitting there at 1 a.m., as as people do when they've just had children, feeding my child, and Gillian Triggs had just released her report on children in detention. And as I held my child, I realised that the children they were talking about on the screen I was watching were just down the road from me. They were at Maribyrnong Detention Centre. Those children who were rocking back and forth in distress, who were drawing pictures where other children would be drawing sunshine and weird houses and stick figures, they were drawing blood and trauma. And I looked at my child and I thought, that detention centre is just down the road. Really, what I should be doing right now is getting down there and climbing those fences myself and pulling them down. But really, I lack the upper body strength for that, amongst (laughs) many other problems. But it got me thinking about those fences. Somebody built those fences. Somebody patrolled those fences. And so after years of slamming our head against the door of government, I suddenly thought, hang on a second, it's corporations that built those fences, that patrol those fences, that hold those children. What about if instead of government, we tried the corporations? So we did. And 18 months later, I was sitting on the 42nd story of a major European bank talking to bank executives with a 100,000 word report in front of me, which forensically, forensically detailed every human rights violation that was occurring in Australia's offshore detention centres, 47 violations of international law, trying to convince that bank and many others across Europe to take action against the corporations. An action they did take. $28 million pulled out of the corporation, and by the time we left Europe, the corporation themselves had announced that they were exiting the offshore detention centres. We had finally managed to make in this small section breaking human rights more expensive than abiding by them. When you get stuck, find another way. The next thing that I learned, really, that is something very important for all of us, and I truly appreciate the introductions today and the presence of so many incredible women, But the third thing to remember when you work on human rights, I think, or you care about it, is we are not the hero. I'm not the hero. The other people aren't the baddie. The world is a lot greyer than that. And that lesson came to me two years ago, when the companies had fled Manus Island Detention Centre, but the Australian government still stubbornly refused to let people go. And we faced a humanitarian crisis. On Manus Island, 1,000 men were detained in that detention centre, locked in by the Navy, with no power, no water, no food. And we knew it was coming. 
For months we knew this was coming. The exit date had been announced. And we had tried to entice every media institution in the country to go to PNG because we knew an unfortunate reality, which is if no one has pictures of a humanitarian crisis, that humanitarian crisis doesn't happen. But we failed. We couldn't get anyone to go. But someone told us about an undercover way we could get to Manus Island. So together with our best media guy, my co-director and myself at GetUp, decided to get on a plane with one mission, to bear witness and obtain footage that could be sent across TV screens and newspapers to show the plight of these men to the world. A few days later, I found myself in a rowing boat in the middle of the night, watching the dark shore anxiously for the four repeated flashes of light that signalled it was safe to silently slip the oars towards the Manus Detention Centre, avoiding the guns and flashlights from the PNG Navy searching the water on either side. The night before, one of the Manus Island locals who couldn't bear the starving men on their ancestral lands had approached the front of the detention center to throw a bag of rice over the fence. She was shot. So we were approaching from sea, from the back. And as I sat there waiting for the tiny flash of light, I stopped and thought, my God, what a terribly selfish thing I'm about to do. Because I have two children who need me and rely on me, as many other people do, as nearly everyone does. And I knew that when that flash of light came, we were gonna wriggle past the Navy, run through the dark jungle, and then spend six hours filming in a detention camp of 1,000 starving detained men hitting the ground in panic and burying our camera lights every time a jeep of Navy personnel sped around the center yelling and flashing their lights. What a terribly risky, horribly selfish thing to do. Because that's the truth of it in those moments and in all the choices facing us. There's no easy answer. I still do think it was a selfish thing to do. And at the same time as I felt like it was the right and indeed the only thing to do. But I've remembered that lesson ever since. Because when we think like that, when we look at people who prioritize their family, their fun, their enjoyment, the people who care and need for them, sometimes people like me and many others who support human rights can't help feel like that's not good enough, that that's, that's a different thing from building the kind of world that we need. But to my mind, that's completely wrong. And indeed, it's kind of moral elitism that doesn't prioritize the kindness, the community, the truth, the everyday actions that so many people make that are gonna be absolutely central in the years ahead. And that trip taught me my final lesson as well, which is remember who you're doing this for. And if it's not you and yours, as many of the women on stage do, then those people that you are doing it for need to be at the center of decision making. Because as we flew out of PNG with the footage of the, uh, of the camps hidden in our underwear, we faced a major decision. Who do we give this footage to? The first footage taken by outside people of inside the Manus Island detention camp, who do we give it to? Do we give it to the media institutions, the fantastic media institutions, the ABC, the Guardian, the Age, who had fought fairly for many years to cover this issue? Or, do we owe it to these men to put it somewhere which would deliver the biggest shock to this government? So we asked those offshore. They said impact, they said shock. So I handed those footage, the international exclusive, over to the Daily Telegraph, which ran it across national newspapers under the title Manus Hell. And that approach of working strategically with those impacted is something that is absolutely integral to our work. When we were negotiating the passage of the Medivac Bill through Parliament, we would finish negotiations at 11.30 and then come home and get on the phone to Manus and Nauru. And every one of those people, the parents of the children in the photographs around Kids of Nauru, the people who took the photographs, the leaders in the camps who organised votes on different questions around the negotiations of the Medivac Bill. We stuck to the maxim 
nothing about them without them. Even when uncomfortable or difficult, even when through gritted teeth and irate phone calls from numerous editors of the incredible left-wing press, you hand an international exclusive to the Murdoch press because nothing about them without them. So they are the lessons I've learned. I hope they help you as much as they help me.